Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to Rochester City Council's Speak to Council Hour. Um, we have two lists, the A list that will be people speaking on legislation that we'll be um, addressing tonight, and a B list, people who are speaking on legislation that is not uh, being discussed tonight or things that are not part of our formal legislation. She will be called up by our city clerk. Um, normally she calls the person to speak and the next person so that person can kind of get ready. When you speak, come up to the podium and you will have two minutes to speak. We have a clock that it times your speaking um, time remaining and when it gets to zero, it will beep. At that point, we would ask that you finish your statements. We do have, as you can see, a number of speakers tonight. We would like to try and get through as many as possible, so we will begin. Mike Lee, followed by Valerie White Whitty. Good evening, I'm Mike Lee. Um, Rochester will become the 63rd municipality to approve this ordinance, uh, along with lots of other states and municipalities, to include Buffalo, Philadelphia, when you vote tonight, 63rd. Secondly, this is the first step towards a long implementation process for this ordinance. We're going to work with employers, with count, with clients, with parole, probation, business organization to get folks to understand how to move forward with this, how to really implement it, and give people the opportunity to compete. Third, I want to talk about um, some the, the feeling, the myth that this imposes additional restraints on employers. This ordinance is an amendment to the city's human rights law, which requires, which regulates already employment discrimination throughout the city. The law states the city has the responsibility to act to ensure that every individual within this city is afforded an equal opportunity to enjoy a full and productive life and that the failure to provide such equal opportunity, whether because of discrimination, prejudice, or for intolerance in employment, housing, threatens the peace, order, health, safety, and general welfare of the city and its inhabitants. Another bit is that the, the band box prevents employers from conducting background checks and requires them to hire people with a record. This ordinance does not prevent anybody from conducting background checks. It's only when they do it after the initial interview. And also, an employer is still going to hire the most qualified person, not just the person who has a record. So that's another myth. The third myth is that the ban exposes employers to liability and litigation. And I'll stop there. Somebody else will pick up. Valerie White Lee, followed by Precious Danielle, and Jordan Bertrand. I'm a mentor coordinator at Judicial Process Commission. Judicial Process Commission for 42 years have worked to assist those that are exiting our criminal correctional facilities, struggling to get their lives together. 80%, 80% of our inmates in our county jails are there because of addiction. Some have felonies from crimes resulting from supporting their habits. Others have misdemeanors. They encounter insurmountable barriers in trying to make a successful transition out of a life of addiction and crime into a law-abiding, tax-paying citizen. Regardless of where you live, in Penfield, Pittsburgh, or Fairport, we all have relatives, friends, and neighbors who are in this situation or have been in this situation. Some say these people should just reap what they sow, but I am here to state that some of them are reaping what their parents and their grandparents have sown. When you are raised in a dysfunctional family that results in having warped values and beliefs, you are automatically disadvantaged. I interviewed a lady who was actually taken away from her mother because her mother had co-occurring disorders, mental health, and drug abuse. She was raised in foster homes, in reformatories, in juvenile detention facilities, and she was in a, a domestic violence situation where she got a, a, a legal gun to protect herself against this individual. She was convicted. She did time in Monroe County Correctional Facility. She is struggling now to obtain employment to support her three children. I have a client who is literally in tears, graduated from college summa cum laude, and actually was struggling, couldn't even get an interview. It's heartbreaking to work diligently to receive a certificate of release of disabilities to prove that you have been rehabilitated, have a college degree, and have a job training certificate, and continue to get doors closed in your face. 
we can no longer afford to not utilize the skills and qualifications of the, those with criminal records. The National Employment Law Project states, shutting individuals with criminal records out of job market compromises the economy and public safety. One out of four individuals have criminal records, an estimated 65 million individuals. Are we saying that 65 million people need not apply? I want to expound on a statement by Reverend Marvin McFinkel when he spoke last Tuesday. Quote, that box more often than not results in a person not being considered for the job that they are pursuing. Diminished employment opportunities tend to result in one of two things. First, a person is forced into the lowest paying jobs and is unable to adequately provide for themselves or their family. I want to speak to you about the first thing that he said. I am one of those many that fit this box, working low wage jobs and never getting paid enough money to take care of myself. I have a work history, graduated summa cum laude from college with a master's degree in arts. I also have the scar of having a past criminal history. I could not take care of myself and I sank into a depressive, despairing state. I lived in transitional housing that cost $25,000 a year, and about 40 women lived there. That's a lot of money to spend on people who are capable of work if given the chance. When I was released from that harrowing experience, I did not give up and vowed never to be in that situation again and have it. I heard about a job in one of the clinics and the Transition Clinic Network, a consortium that employs people like me to provide health care to formerly incarcerated individuals. Here are some of the positive things we can do when we work. We enhance public safety. We are closer to our families. We are no longer taking care of our state, which saves millions of dollars. We are no longer going to prison. Nationwide spending on prison has risen uh, six times faster than spending on education and spending more money has not always resulted in better correctional system, nor has it resulted in us winning the war on drugs. We are taxpayers giving back to our communities and building community advocacy models that teach our residents advocacy skills to help implement, implant, implant policies. Uh, this is not just about justice. It is about that promissory note that Dr. King so eloquently spoke of in his I Have a Dream speech Due process is also a promissory note, stating that when the sentence is over, it is over, and the letter of the law is not to discriminate against people who have criminal histories. Joyce Burkhoff, Eric Hilton. Hi, I'm Reverend Joy Burkhoff, Executive Director of the Coffee Connection. Besides having the best coffee in town, which we roast ourselves, um, we have the privilege of working with women in recovery from addiction. In fact, those are the two requirements to be a part of our program or to get a job at the Coffee Connection. Um, be a woman and have an addiction. The joke is that it's also required to have a felony. Someone asked me if two were enough, how many did they have to have to work at the Coffee Connection? I want to mention some of our star people. Holly is our HR person in writing our grant um, this afternoon for the Women's Foundation. Alyssa is our manager and uh, amazing woman handling all kinds of stress. Renee is our apprentice coffee roaster and event coordinator. Charmaine, who got out of incarceration in um, October, is our head cook. I was waiting for her to get out. Stacy is a manager. What do they all have in common besides addiction? They all have criminal records. I would be lost without them. I will fight to keep them. And my opinion is that when we um, exclude people with criminal histories from working, that we are robbing ourselves and robbing our society. We are paying for them to be in prison. We are paying for them to be in treatment. We are paying for them to be on social services when we could actually clear the road and let them have a job and pay for themselves. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Gary Woody. I am currently the new board president of, of the of Judicial Process Commission. 
Now, what I wanted to say was I support the ban the bots. One reason is because, and I want to let you, you hear some names you're familiar with Toyota, Chevy, Spinach, Eggs, Wegmans. These are all companies that have had, at one point or another, something that we call a recall. And what is a recall? A recall, really, when you think about it, is just a business saying, forgive us for the mistake that we made. Would you please allow us to make it better? If we can forgive businesses for the recalls that they have, and some of them are multiple, why can't we not forgive a human being who is trying to get a job? I have a story of an individual here right here in the city of Rochester who tried to get a job. And I'm going to say he's not, he was not an African American guy, he was a Caucasian guy, trying to get a job here in the city of Rochester and unable to do so. So he moved to Genesee County, was not able to do so. He finally, he finally started to get very depressed. He lost his home, he got a girlfriend, he almost lost his girlfriend. And he now found a job in Syracuse, which he travels to every day. But I'll tell you something. His demeanor is so much better. He stands so much taller because of why? Because he's got a job. He's got something to hold on to. He has a young child to support. And so I stand here not just, I stand here not just for him, but for all those who have children, who have families, and people who want to do the next right thing. And just to give them a chance to, to finally try to get, to get a, a job. And so I'll end with this. Do not, do not, I repeat, do not allow anyone to sit high and look low to judge you because everyone has a chapter in their life that they're not willing to talk about. And this is what I want to say. Thank you. Is Eric here? Jamie? Hi, my name is Jamie Dougherty. I'm a researcher in criminal justice at RIT, so I kind of want to speak to you from that angle. Um, no one has really done research on the band box issue in particular, but the research that's out there on employment discrimination for people with criminal records um, hints at how this policy should go, and that is that it should have minimal negative effect on the hiring processes for employers, but it should have important positive effects if it's enforced properly. Um, we all know jobs are hard for anyone to find right now, but the truth is many studies have shown that indicating you have a criminal record on an application cuts your chances of getting a call back by half. And if you're a black man, it cuts it down by another two-thirds to a rate of 5% callback rates. So, um, and the EEOC, when they do studies on the gender, race, and age discrimination problems, they found that about two-thirds of discrimination occurs up front on a job application. So banning the box by removing that stigma from the job application on the front should do quite a bit to get people more on the door. Um, and it will curb that upfront discrimination. And um, it is still likely that employers will have bias once they find out about people's records, but at least people can get in the door and speak um, about their conviction, speak for him or herself about who they are. Um, banning the box should help employers fairly differentiate between applicants and criminal records. As it stands, everyone with the records just checks yes and writes will explain in the interview. But that doesn't tell you if they had a felony, if they had 12 felonies, or if they just have one misdemeanor from 20 years ago. Um, so by reviewing the actual background check and talking with applicants, employers will get a much better sense of who people actually are and the kind of person and employee they would be instead of just judging a check. <coughs> so banning the box should also help employers comply with New York State Article 23A, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and EEOC guidelines on this issue. And the federal EEOC does recommend that ban the box as a best practice. So while well, banning the box won't necessarily land someone a job, and there's still plenty of barriers in the way to keep the public safe and help people not get jobs if they're not appropriate for those jobs based on their records, at least it, it would help people get in the door and curb unnecessary employment discrimination. But I want to emphasize that it needs to be properly enforced and not just a figure of the policy. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I come to you as uh, somebody with experience in law enforcement. I want to date myself. I don't want. 
But um, I'm probably the last person you'd expect to see an initiative like this. Um, and frankly, if there was a better law enforcement strategy, I probably would not be here. Uh, but, but I have yet to see one. Um, this certainly was an initiative that I could see would strongly impact recidivism. And I got involved uh, after looking at some of the benefits and realizing just what a positive thing it was to move forward with. That and a call from uh, Reverend Carter that I have a lot of respect for and encouraged me to get involved in it. Um, some points I want to call to your attention. Uh, a 2011 study of the formerly incarcerated found that employment was the single most important influence on decreasing recidivism. And not even police strategies um, came close to those numbers. A three-year recidivism study found that formerly incarcerated persons with one year of employment had a 16% recidivism rate over three years compared to 52.3% recidivism rate for all of the Department of Correction releases. I mean, I, I was bold over. And lastly, on that point, a study at the of state level data and included that a 1%, 1% drop in the unemployment rate caused a 2% decline in burglary, a 1.5% decline in larceny, and a 1% decrease in auto theft. Just 1% in employment decreased numbers, unemployment rate. Now, as a side note, I, I do believe, I think that uh, if you pay your uh, dues and you stay out of trouble, I think you're another in the community, and I welcome you back. Thank you for your time. Good evening. I appreciate your time and your open-mindedness. My name is Deborah Blair. I began working at Wegmans at 16 years of age. I began teaching special education at 19 years old and continued teaching for 31 years. Throughout those working years, I attended college in the evening, maintained a household, was a Girl Scout leader, and because money was tight for daycare and family expenses, I obtained a second job at night at a group home. Superwoman I was. In the year 2006, my ex-husband committed suicide, leaving our daughter. In addition, I lost my home and all of its contents in a house fire. My anxiety and depression increased with each passing day. Now, this is absolutely no excuse. However, I began to self-medicate with alcohol. Alcohol pushed through my entire life as if it was a bulldozer. I now possess a felony DWI record of which I'm absolutely sorry and ashamed of. I was asked to resign. I was consumed. Who was I then? I then returned to school to obtain my certified alcohol and substance abuse counseling trainee degree. And I'm now studying for my New York State Board for my certified alcohol and substance abuse counseling degree. I have completed internships at Delphi Drug and Alcohol and at Recovery Houses of Rochester. Thank you, Van Smith, for the opportunity. Don't we all wish for a positive reentry rather than recidivism? I believe it is extremely important for those of us who have made very wrong decisions in the past to be given the chance to look at us today and not label us forever. If not, this is only promotes recidivism. Anyone here could be in my shoes. I have a disease. Would you not hire me if I had cancer? I looked for employment for over two years, every day. Inside this suitcase is all of my efforts to obtain employment, all the follow-up phone calls for me. This suitcase is heavy, and so is my heart. Potential employers will not tell me, I will not hire you because you are an ex-offender or have a felony. When I asked one potential employer what I could have done better in the interview, because I thought I did very well, she replied it was because I had a bit of makeup on my dress. Please consider, please consider with an open mind to be in the box. Doesn't everyone in recovery or not deserve a chance to prove one's worth? I stand before you looking for employment. Will you please hire me? Thank you for your time. Center, a nonprofit law firm where we represent local people. Lots of stories. 
Chicago. Almost 40 years ago, the New York State Legislature passed a landmark civil rights statute prohibiting unfair discrimination against persons with a criminal record when they apply for jobs. And under Article 28A, and for the last 38 years, it is considered unfair discrimination in New York for an employer to refuse to hire someone solely because that person has a criminal record. And for the last 38 years, employers in New York are required to evaluate these applications by considering eight individualized factors, which include whether there's a direct relationship between the criminal offense and the job, the seriousness of the offense, the age of the person at the time of the offense, and the amount of time that's passed since the offense was committed. And after 38 years, we all know that some employers continue to take unlawful shortcuts. By enacting the Ban the Box Ordinance, we will help employers comply with Article 28A and other civil rights laws by delaying the consideration of an applicant's conviction history until after the initial interview. This will help give everyone a fair and equal chance. Thank you very much. Followed by Nicole Harris and Jeff Conrad. Hi, my name is Anissa Mendezabal. I'm the Monroe County Director for the Center for Employment Opportunities. Um, our agency has a vision that anyone with a recent criminal history who wants to work um, has preparation and support needed to find a job with safe connected with the labor force. So that's what we do. We help people prepare for, um, experience um, job transition jobs, and get employed in unsubsidized jobs. So every single one of our participants has a criminal conviction. We recently uh, evaluated our outcomes and produced an, out an economic impact uh, a report, which found that our first 239 participants who were placed in unsubsidized employment, that's jobs in the community, uh, generated over $2 million in earnings. So over 2 million, I'm sorry, over 2.5 million if you include our transitional jobs income that they received. And we still consider this a conservative number because we did not follow them for more than a year after they were employed, but many of these folks are still working today and still generating income today. So again, a conservative number of the 239 people placed in jobs in the community is that they generated $2.5 million worth of earnings that they took home to support themselves, their families, and their communities through taxes that they paid, through rent that they paid, and through the purchase in the community. 89% of these earnings went to neighborhoods where 20% or more of the residents live below the federal poverty line. So um, it's important to remember that um, people who are working have less need and their, and their families have less need to be on public assistance. And that there are many other benefits to taxpayers when people are working instead of being in prison. That's all somebody else can look at. Nicole Harris.
People who face struggle with barriers to employment are forced under public assistance or into other forms of survival work, and taxpayer, taxpayers foot the bill. One study found that putting 100 formerly incarcerated people back to work would increase their lifetime tax contribution by $1.9 million, all while, all while saving $2 million annually by keeping them out of the criminal justice system. Last, ban the box puts people with records back to work. Minneapolis found that banning the box decreased transactional work, did not slow down the hiring process, and resulted in over 50% of applicants with records being hired. In Durham County, North Carolina, the number of applicants with records recommended for hire nearly tripled two years after Ban the Box was passed, and 96.8% of those recommended ultimately got the job. Removing the box off the job application is the one modest common sense step that you can take today. It gives workers an opportunity, a fair opportunity at receiving a job, a fair chance to provide for their families, and a fair chance to be an asset to their community. Thank you. Jeff Conrad, uh, Good evening. Um, my name is Jeff Conrad. I'm the Western New York Regional Director for Center for Employment Opportunities. Uh, I operate both the uh, Buffalo and uh, Rochester operations. Um, as Anissa said, we've made uh, in just uh, three short years an economic impact of about $2.5 million in this community. <coughs> And it is the individual who wrote the Buffalo Law and uh, helped drive to pass this. I also represent the most conservative district in Buffalo. Uh, the reason why I connected my name to in Buffalo and the reason why I'm here today for the second time talking about this uh, is because I'm pretty passionate about this law. Um, it creates fairness uh, and allows an individual uh, to get back on their feet. Uh, there's studies out there, and I just read a recent report that both Buffalo and Rochester are within the top five core cities in the United States. Uh, if, you, if we want to overcome that, we need to put money in people's pockets, we need to put people to work. And that's what this law does. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, don't allow all this complicated talk. It's about putting people to work. And that's what we're here for. Um, that creates more stability in your city as lawmakers, creates uh, as direct effects on their economy, on public safety, and at the end of the day, it's just fair. And so uh, I urge you to uh, join the club um, and pass uh, this ordinance uh, just like we have and the other 62, I believe, cities uh, that have done this uh, as well. So uh, I, I urge you to vote yes. <laughs> I'm Alan Daly, and I'm the board president of the Greater Rochester Community of Churches. And when I think about this, uh, this particular bill, I think about the purpose for incarceration, which for me is when someone has you know, broken the law and been caught and been tried and found guilty, and in many cases, as a result of plea bargain, uh, they go to prison. And then, as part of their, <clears throat> uh, their incarceration, many of them take classes, develop new skills, take the time and the energy to get counseling, both while they're in prison and then after they get out as part of their probation terms. So as, we, as they then prepare to get a new job, getting a new job in today's market itself is tough enough. Uh, <clears throat> for many prospective employers, uh, for their offers, they get they get many many <clears throat> job applications, and <clears throat> whether it's ethical or not, they use whatever whatever means they can to pare down the list. And so, <clears throat> if there's any if there's a box, and uh, there's <clears throat> any indication that anything might be perceived as as negative, whether it would be prison terms, whether it would be gender, whether it would be race. Uh, one way or the other, they'll use this to, to cut back. So as I think about this, and being a part of the faith community, one of the thoughts that occurred to me was that <clears throat> most of our, all of our sacred texts include the whole thought that 
Others should be treated as we want to be treated. So I would just encourage you, as you prepare to vote on this, to think about, is this the way I would want to be treated if I were in this place? Thank you very much. And we Good evening. I'm Reverend Louis Stewart, and I'm president of the United Christian Leadership Ministry. I want to talk about two things this evening. First, I urge the council to pass the legislation on Man the Box. I was a prison chaplain for 15 years, both in the medium correctional facility and a high security correctional facility. So I know firsthand what brothers and sisters, as inmates, go through in the prison system. Now, if the state is not ashamed to hire them in the prison system, because they do make your license plates, mm -hmm. all right? They do do food services, and they do do court crap, which is furniture that they sell. Wow. If they can do that, then you can help them to receive better employment so they can help their families. Secondly, we need to look at the reformation of the present severe review process, which is largely ineffective. We need a severe review board which has transparency, has subpoena power, and possesses an independent investigative authority. Without these factors, there will continue to be mistrust and suspicion in regards to the Rochester Police Department. Moreover, I call for dialogue around this issue by those who have a stake in it. We, the community, can no longer delay or put it back on the shelf with the excuse that there are no funds for it. We need an ad hoc working committee to focus and address these issues of transparency at all levels of the process. Now is the time to act. Now is the time to build better police community relations. Some of us are beginning this process. We need you, the council, to join us. Thank you. Hello, yes, my name is Michael Henry, and no disrespect to anybody, but I'm here representing all the minorities who are felonies and the ones that are going to be future felons because trust me, if we don't fix the system now, we're going to see a lot more felonies and felons being put through into our society. And what I would just like to say is this, I would like to pose this question to everyone in here. I'm sure everyone in here has a cell phone, like a cell phone bill or maybe a laptop. Imagine if you had to pay for that cell phone twice. Imagine if you had to pay your RGE bill twice. Imagine if you had to pay your rent twice. But when you ask a person to check on that box, have they been convicted of a felony? You're asking them to pay for their crime twice. Because once you operate as a once, once you pay for your crime, and you pay your debt to society, that should be it. You paid your debt to society. That's why you're punished, punished and that's what that's for. And when you have to pay twice, this is totally preposterous, and this is something we definitely have to take a stand on. And I was told, I was told by my bishop that when something is broke, either you fix it or you get rid of it. None of us has anything in our house. If you have, imagine if you have a toaster in your house and it's not working, it's just taking up space. You either fix it or you get rid of it. So that's what we have to do in the system. Either fix it or get rid of it or change it or do something. But right now, but as we see what's going on, these, stuff, these, these children and these young babies are being eaten up by the streets, and then when they come home, they have nothing to come home to. So we definitely have to stand up and, and make this, and I want to see this not only in Rochester, but I'm here to take this on a national level. So if anybody in here needs me for anything, anything that I can do to help you have both my hands and my voice that will help to take this to the next level, because this is something that's a nationwide epidemic. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Reverend Lawrence Hargrave. I'm a pastor for Outreach Ministries at Edward First Amendment Methodist Church. 
we serve a number of people who are ex offenders. We feed on average 130 persons six days a week. We have a clinic that provides health care. We have a clothing ministry that is one of the few that if a person has a notice from a social worker, probation officer, a pastor, they can come in and pick out what they need for free. Many of the people who need these services need these services because they've been incarcerated and have not been able to work. I see person after person who's been trying job after job to try to get a job. We are challenged these days because uh, our educational system, people like to say, is broken. I would say that it's not necessarily the system that is broken itself, but I would say that we need to have parents who go to work every day and have their children be able to see them go to work every day so that they can be encouraged to do better and move forward themselves. Senator Elizabeth Warren uh, of Massachusetts uh, noted that a homeless man caught with some marijuana can go to prison. And once he goes to prison, it's almost a life sentence. But she said the people who have laundered money for the cartels that do drugs internationally, including HSBC, that used to have a bank almost on every corner here. And they left here because they couldn't make enough money. But they can make enough money for the drug dealers, and no one goes to jail. They go back home to their families. So, my final point, I'm in favor of Band the Box, and mostly because it's the right thing to do. Good evening. Uh, I'm a former chair of uh, the uh, of JPC. Uh, I also personally mentored about 35 men uh, when they came home here to Rochester after being incarcerated. I want to tell you a little bit about how hard it is for them to restart their life. I won't even tell you about them finding a place to live or making amends to their own family or for the victims of their crimes. I won't tell you about them dealing with their alcoholism or drug addiction or their physical or mental health issues. I won't tell you about them trying to go back to school. I'm just going to tell you about them finding a job, okay? And why you need to ban the box. These returning citizens have to learn about the job market for people with few skills and little experience. In the best of times, there aren't many, and you can just imagine what it is in today's economy. They search out for jobs in restaurants, warehouses, gardening, telemarketing, construction, and other fields. They learn how to find the jobs at labor ready, online, in weekly magazines, and newspapers from friends and family, or just noticing the help wanted with signs and windows. They learn about the, the, where the job, job openings exist. Then they need to get to it. That's not easy when they live in the city and the jobs are in the suburbs. Often the bus doesn't even go from their neighborhood to uh, where the jobs are located. Or imagine waiting for the bus connections in the middle of the winter. Even if they drive, they don't very often aren't familiar with uh, how to get to the suburban areas. They have to prepare a job uh, resume. They need to convince the employer that they're no longer the boy who made a mistake years ago. They have to fill out a job application, and that's where the tough part is. If, what, if it's on, that's why you need to ban the box. Because if they can't get behind, beyond the front door, beyond the box, everything else is in vain. Sooner or later, they get frustrated. They can't find a job and go back to a life of crime. And that's the tragedy. It's a tragedy for the new victim, for the perpetrator, and for each of their families. It's a tragedy for taxpayers and public safety. It's a tragedy for employers, too, because employers prevent themselves from a large supply of good, hard-working employees. Okay? It's a tragedy for Rochester. It becomes more a tale of two cities. 
That's why you need to ban the box. Hello, my name is Richard Yannick. I live on Park Avenue in the city of Rochester. I would like to thank Adam McFadden and Lovely Warren for their efforts on behalf of people like me with a criminal record. I know firsthand how difficult it is to find a job when you have a blemish on your record. As a result, I applaud you for your efforts to push ban the box. I recommend all council members vote positively on this and I hope you all continue the efforts this started. After all, as you, Adam McFadden, have mentioned, RPD is out of control. Both you and the mayor have mentioned that there are officers who exceed their authority. Further public records show there are a number of officers who routinely lie under oath, harass the public, and arrest people who have committed no crime. Thus, out of control, activity by officers has resulted in numerous people getting police records who did nothing. For example, just last May, Benny Moore was attacked, beaten, arrested, and eventually convicted because he was in his wheelchair waiting for the bus and would not move. Now he has a criminal record because we cannot control our police officers. As much as Benny Moore needs to ban the box, we all need to get our PE back under control. It is time we consider spending the money on pistol cameras on all officers. While we work on this, it is also time to reconstruct our civilian review board so it has investigative and disciplinary power. After all, a strong civilian review board would send a message to the rogue officers that such behavior will not be tolerated. It will prevent many citizens from being arrested unnecessarily and keep many from ever having the embarrassing conversation about their police record. So please, Mr. McFadden, do the right thing and finish the Band of Box campaign by starting a campaign for a strong independent civilian review board.